Hello everyone. <clears throat> Today I'll be talking about another one of my favorite topics, autoencoders. Autoencoders are neural networks that are just actually trained with a loss that enforces copying its input to the output. But there are hidden layers in an autoencoder, at least one, that describes a code or a different representation of the input. So autoencoders are often described as having two parts an encoder that takes the original input and encodes it into the code layer Z, and a decoder that takes the code Z and performs a reconstruction or decoding back to as close to the original input as it can get. So the penalty is to see how close X is to X prime, which is the same as looking at how close X is to F of g of x, so the x put through the encoder and then out through the decoder. So this loss penalizes the reconstruction from being dissimilar from the input. And usually this is enforced as a mean squared error of the original input with a loss. And this might be your first example of a self-supervised loss. Since neural networks are sort of designed in a supervised paradigm, when we use them in an unsupervised fashion, we would use this type of self-supervised loss. And if you go to my neural networks class, you'll see that there are several self-supervised losses these days. But this one is maybe the most famous of them. So how do you actually train an autoencoder? You train it the same way as every other neural network, just using backpropagation. So this is what a schematic of an autoencoder typically looks like, though not always. So here you have the input layer here, and then subsequently you go down and reduce the dimensionality until you're at your so-called informational bottleneck code layer. This layer is providing an informational bottleneck for the decoder, meaning anything that the decoder produces has to come from the information in this layer, and that is forcing this layer to create a meaningful embedding. Autoencoders were first introduced in a science paper back in 2006 by Jeffrey Hinton and Ruslan Selakudinov. One analogy that has been used for autoencoders is that of the camera obscura. You can think of this as a renaissance version of an autoencoder from back before real cameras existed. There would be a box with a pinhole and it would take the outside screen, outside scene. You know, here you have a castle and some mountains and grass and it's projecting it onto the screen via this pinhole. But it's projecting it upside down usually, but the painter carefully copies this and turns it right side up. So here you can think of this as an encoding, and this pinhole as the bottleneck, and this painter actually as the decoder. And then the hidden representation, one of them is here. Um, so autoencoders, as you saw from the camera obscura example, can learn something meaningful if there's a bottleneck in the information. And that's why sometimes these are called undercomplete autoencoders. So this will make the training have interesting properties for the embedding layer Z, properties some, somewhat similar to the nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods we saw at the beginning of this course. So the reason is because the, this is actually a way of reducing dimensions so that you can reconstruct most of the information in the data with fewer dimensions. So this is a form of lossy compression or dimensionality reduction. And in fact, in the special case, when you have a linear decoder, that means a decoder without any nonlinear activation functions, and you're using mean squared error loss, it can be proven that the code layer of the autoencoder learns something equivalent to PCA, or rather it spans the same subspace as n dimensions of PCA if you have n neurons in your bottleneck layer. Of course, usually we don't use linear autoencoders. We use nonlinear autoencoders because we want powerful nonlinear generalizations of PCA kind of like kernel PCA 
or with even more functionality than kernel PCA because neural networks are very flexible and you can penalize them in various ways to learn different uh, embeddings with different features. But one thing you have to be careful of when you're designing an autoencoder is giving it too much capacity. If you don't bottleneck enough, the input can basically actually be copied to the output. And we wouldn't want that. That would result in a fantastic reconstruction, but who cares? The embedding layer isn't learning anything meaningful or isn't reducing the dimensionality. So in fact, you may not want a fantastic reconstruction, which might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but the reconstruction error is there to combine with other losses, which we'll see in a second. But first, let's look at what the embedding layer of an autoencoder actually looks like when you compare it to PCA. This is from the original autoencoder paper. Here we have the MNIST digits 0 through 9, each indicated by these differently shaped dots. You see PCA has this kind of embedding, whereas an autoencoder doesn't have this much overlap. It actually looks a little bit more how, like how FATE or TSNI or something would look where it's separating the classes more clearly, perhaps because of the reconstruction loss as well as the nonlinear activations which are creating a nonlinear embedding. Here's an embedding of documents. This again shows that the embedded documents separate by classes very cleanly. And in fact, it shows that if you use the encoding in an autoencoder to retrieve documents based on a key, you get a higher fraction of more accurately retrieved documents. And these results are both in the original science paper by Hinton et al. So let's get back to this idea that you need to regularize an autoencoder. Of course, one of the inherent regularizations is the reduction in dimensionality in the code layer. But you can have other ways of reducing the capacity of an autoencoder. Um, you can use regularizations to modify the loss function to encourage other desirable properties. And so this regularization would play against the reconstruction to learn meaningful embeddings. So regularizations are a way in the neural network world to express inductive bias in the solution. That means kind of veer the solution in a certain direction. For example, you might want a smart, sparse solution or a smooth solution. Two examples that actually we've covered before are L1 and L2 regularizations. L1 is just the sum of the absolute values. So if you have your original cost function C sub 0 here, you add a lambda or a regularization parameter plus just the sum of all the weights. And so L1 and L2 both come from the names of those respective norms we talked about earlier in class. So L2, of course, is the squared sum of all the weights. And L1 and L2 regularizations prefer small weights, but they do actually differ from one another. The way that they differ can be illustrated in this example. Suppose you have this very simple network, and you have these two as the weights. Notice that L1 does not really have a preference between these two. W and 0 versus W over 2 and W over 2. And we've seen before that if a neuron's activation is off, its gradient is very small. So it's likely to pick, L1 is actually likely to pick this solution. Whereas if you looked at the weight squared, this is W squared, whereas this is W squared over 4 plus W squared over 4, which is W squared over 2, so actually, it prefers this solution. It has a smaller L2 norm. So you see that L2 prefers to share weights and have weights all over your network, but have them be low valued, whereas L1 prefers to pick particular weights. So in that sense, you can see that L1s select specific features and have sparsity in their neuronal activations, whereas L2 gives non-sparsity, <coughs> no feature selection, but low weights that are resilient to noise, actually. Let's think about autoencoding MNIST a little bit more, just to see different ways we can use autoencoders. Let's say this is the original input. The encoder takes it through. Remember, <coughs> this dimensionality of this input is very large. It's 28 by 28. 
And you can have a much smaller compressed representation that can be 8, 16, 32 neurons. And then you can decode out. And the remarkable thing is that the reconstructions are usually very accurate, showing that the original dimensions had a lot of redundancy within them. <coughs> Let's try it with 32 nodes in the hidden layer. And we're using a cross entropy loss per pixel because we have 0, 1 pixel values. And it, this network trained for 50 epochs. And you see what the original looks like versus the reconstructed digit. So um, if you change this neural network and you add an L1 sparsity per layer, now the training loss and the test loss have a little bit of a difference, but the digits actually themselves look remarkably similar. So as it turns out, people have shown that these regularizations don't actually restrict capacity purely per se, but they just give some inductive biases. So what's the difference between these two? Certainly not in the reconstruction. It is in the code layer, which is more sparse in the L1. <coughs> Let's look a little bit at denoising autoencoders. This is another functionality of autoencoders now where we actually care about the reconstruction. A traditional autoencoder minimizes just the reconstruction loss. The denoising autoencoder, what it does is, instead of giving the original input, it adds noise or corruption of the original input. And this noise is referred to as this tilde. So it actually encodes the noisy version of the input and then decodes it, but now measures reconstruction versus the original. So in this way, this reconstruction loss was repurposed to try to denoise this kind of noise. So if you take clean data, repeatedly add different kinds of noise that you want the neural network to learn to take off, and you train it with this version of the reconstruction loss, you get a denoising autoencoder. If you model the corruption process uh, as a conditional probability, then what you're actually getting here is you take x, you take a corrupted version. The corrupted version is taken to an encoder and a decoder. And the decoder is measuring the loss with respect to the original neural network. And so it learns how to take off and denoise the, the um, noise from the input but it also learns what kind of noise is orthogonal to the manifold of the data and what kind of noise is on the manifold. And why does it do that? If you add just some kind of corruption, it moves the data away from the main manifold and this denoising autoencoder learns to push it back. And it says that this is spurious noise variation. Whereas if you actually change the digit or you change the value along the manifold, it will reconstruct correctly. And one of the ways denoising autoencoders have been used is to denoise images. So if you take this really blurry image, which is image with noise added to it, the denoising autoencoder can be trained to clarify it. And this works with a wide variety of noise types.